Hi, everybody. Welcome to this episode of The Agronomist. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and my headset is giving me grief, and apparently so is my internet connection. All right. Welcome here, everyone. Uh, hello to John, to Warren Schneckenberger, uh, to Jason Vogt. Peter Johnson's here. Wonderful to see everybody in the comments. Yes, we got uh, everything ready to roll on time. So I, I do apologize about last week. We got lots of uh, messages uh, everybody panicking. Where is the show? So here is the show and welcome here. Okay. And yes, uh, John, shout out. Uh, we're somewhat out of the deep freeze. I think we did get uh, a little bit of warm up here as well here west of Ottawa um, and looking forward to a few mild days. Um, and hey, there's uh, wicked weather across the prairie. So everybody stay safe out there. Okay. Before we delve into tonight's show, which I'm super excited about, um, we do have, of course, a couple housekeeping items. Make sure if you collect those CEU credits, you head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomists. Let us know that you've watched this episode. And of course, don't dilly dally. Uh, you only have a certain amount of time uh, to do so. So please do that uh, tomorrow. The post goes up in the morning. Um, so please, uh, please make sure you get over there and do that and let us know. Um, and of course, we have our sponsors. So this show is brought to you by Adama Canada, Real Ag Radio and Mind Your Farm Business. Uh, Adama Canada, we're all in on you. Uh, visit your local rep today. Real Ag Radio runs Monday to Friday on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM and Mind Your Farm Business. Uh, a new episode goes up every two weeks on realagriculture.com and you can find it on YouTube um, and you can download it. You can subscribe uh, wherever you get your podcasts as well. Okay. So tonight's show is going to be a good one. And I, I do want to, I do want to remind everybody that we do take requests for topics. And this is actually one that we had several people ask about over and over. And actually with the topic of biological products, which is what we're going to talk about tonight, has come up on several different episodes. So we are, I've brought together two uh, individuals who are going to walk us through where we're at, where we've come from, what the capabilities are of some of these products, and what's in the pipeline as well. So um, welcome here. So we've got John Trailer of Novazines BioAg, and we've got George Lazarovitz from a &L Biologicals. Did I get that right, George? You did. Oh, yay! And hi, John. How are you? Good. Good. Now, John, where are you joining us from tonight? I'm joining you from Saskatoon. And no conversation with someone from Saskatchewan would be complete without an update on the weather. So that we are in a blizzard, question. a bona fide <laughs> blizzard out here. I just took my kid to soccer and it was touch and go whether I'd get home. But here we are. Uh-huh. Well, thank you for thank you for making it back. Uh, we did have a discussion on real agriculture today. Uh, this blizzard reminded all of us, of course, of our our youth and all the things we used to do to make the most of these blizzards, including either digging out snowdrifts or making our own prairie mountains so that we could actually slide on them as kids. Um, and producer Jay, who's on tonight, shared a wonderful image of him as a kid uh, sliding down the only hills around where he lives, I guess, the mountains that get made out of the snow. Um, so yes, it's indoor soccer, Schneckenberger. It's not well, outdoor on. soccer. <laughs> it's Saskatoon's hardcore, but not that hardcore. We're now, pretty tough, George, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> George, where are you joining us from tonight? <clears throat> I'm from lovely London, Ontario, just oh, yeah. uh, between Detroit and Toronto. Mm -hmm. uh, closer shores of Lake Erie. Yes. So you get, so London, I've been to London a few times. London, I always think of, it's the first time I was ever caught in an Ontario streamer was at London. And I had never encountered the phenomenon of a streamer and how it can be lovely weather on one side, complete blizzard for in, in the streamer and then lovely weather on the other side. Um, very bizarre. Okay. Okay, let's get let's get going. I, I, you know, I it is uh, for both of you your first time on the show, and so we are going to delve into biological products. Um, but I want both of you to sort of introduce yourselves, at least in that context of um, the role you play within this space in the industry. And George, I'll start with you. You're with ANL Biologicals. Uh, give us a bit of your history on working with these products. Sure. Um, so. Um... I worked for Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada as a research scientist for 32 and a half years. And when I decided to retire, uh, uh, I was sort of 
wondering what I should do with the rest of them in my life. I spent a good deal of it looking at diseased crops and uh, just reveled at the sight of a crop that fell down because of disease. And I, uh, I got invited by a and uh, Greg uh, Patterson, to look at uh, perhaps the last part of my life, what is a healthy agriculture ecosystem? So I spent this last 10 years looking at farms that are the highest producers in Ontario and seeing why they perform so much better than neighboring farms, which are producing half the yield. Mm. And I'll tell you how this has helped us to understand the role of microbiology. And you can conceive of this as taking a group of 10,000 people and looking at their microbiology, you'll get an average microbiology of the 10,000 people. But if you could separate the really healthy people from the not so healthy and just focus on those two, you may be able to get a good idea of what is driving their microbiology uh, as far as their health is concerned. Mm, soil health. I can't wait. Okay, John. Now, I, I should, a little spoiler alert, I do have a couple clips tonight, and one of them is with John from a couple of years ago. So, what and it's I a good one. Hey? <laughs> right? It's a good one. Come on. But so, but John, I mean, you have been, uh, you're with Nova Science BioAg, but you've been in this space a while. So tell us about uh, your involvement. Sure. Yeah, really excited to be on. Thanks for having me, Lindsay and, and George. I'm really looking forward to being on with you. I've uh, crossed paths with George a few times, and when I saw his name alongside this live stream, I was really excited. Just a, a wealth of knowledge. So it's going to be, a, I think, a great hour and time well spent. So I'm with Novazymes BioAg. I've been with the BioAg group for about a decade now. And, you know, George mentioned ecological agriculture. I have a degree from UBC in agroecology. Um, you know, 20 years ago, we were really heavy into sustainability. And now, 20 years later, is really th that concept is really becoming mainstream. And I think working with biologicals allows me to put some teeth to that. A lot of people talk about, you know, the need for sustainable agriculture, but what are the solutions? And that's what I like to drill down into, really combining sound agronomy with good science and making it work in the field and making people have a good experience. So. I've had a similar role for the last 10 years, um, a lot of kind of technical training and technical education, whether that be for growers, retails or internal staff. I've managed a lot of field programs as well, both small plot programs across Canada and field scale programs is sort of the way we've directed our attention in biologicals. So looking for the fit, finding those agronomic patterns where we'll have success and trying to get people so kind of moving beyond that, well, I used it, I didn't see any increases, they must not work, right? Trying to move biologicals from the snake oil realm into a mainstream conversation. You used the term I did not, but this is one of the key <laughs> things I do want to talk about tonight is, is, you know, separating out the wheat from the chaff, trying to figure out you know, and, and so George, part of the reason, of course, I asked you is that, I mean, this is one of the things your company does, of course, is trying to identify some of these key components that we want. And, and John, the same thing is, is bringing, if we can identify some of these really neat features of our soil, the soil health ecosystem, and then we can, of course, turn this into something we can add to our soils or, or add to um, a product. I want to dig into sort of how they all work, but also how we get there and then how we sort of sift through uh, the good stuff. Yes, Warren, uh, snake oil. It's, you know, the word's going to come up. So I love that John said it first. Um, yes. Okay. So I do. Yes. Peter is already by the me that I haven't played the first clip yet, but I have referred to it. So I do want to start there because it's a couple of years old um, and it's a great, I think it is a good snapshot of where we were then. And so I want to use that to leap us forward to now. I think it's from 2017. Um, so Jay, if you can cue up the first clip, maybe I'll get to the second one. Maybe I won't. We don't know. Let's take a look. Quick Roots is a relatively new product to Canada. Uh, we have a wettable powder formulation and a planter box formulation. Uh, both, both products are made up of uh, two biologicals. There's a bacteria and a fungus. So your bacteria is a bacillus amyloliquefaciens, and your fungus is a trichoderma virus. 
and they work together to free up nutrients from the soil and feed your plants and ultimately build yield. So to get a little bit more technical, your, your trichoderma, the fungus, is going to help free up some of the inorganic phosphorus in the soil. It's going to cleave apart that uh, bound phosphorus, the, the phosphorus that's bound with calcium. That free calcium then is going to work in the reaction with the bacillus. It's actually a phytase reaction. And that's going to free up some of the organic nutrients in the soil. Uh, your NPK, basically. So you've got uh, kind of two modes of action with the bacteria and the fungus working both independently and in concert. But really what we're trying to do is, is build yield, create stronger plants and, and fill the bin at the end of the year. So is this an advancement in terms of uh, understanding soil microbiology and how we can can work with it? To it's definitely another it? yeah. tool in the toolbox. Uh, it is a new product. We've only had it really for two years. So this year we have about 100 field scale farmer led trials in Western Canada to really get the product out there and understand its agronomic fit. So we've also seen many other new inoculants and fertility products come to the market in the last few years and uh, I think farmers often wonder why, uh, why we should believe that this one is, is the one to use or, or that sort of thing. What, what do you, how do you respond to those concerns? Well, right now really it's buyer beware. In 2013, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency dropped the requirements to prove efficacy of a product. And really since then, the floodgates have opened. We've seen about 150 new products enter the market in Canada with no need to prove their efficacy. They have to prove their safety, they have to prove their environmental safety, human safety, plant safety. After that, companies can make claims. And it's really, you know, you do see some interesting claims out there. I think my favorite one was 50% increase in lentil yield. It was based on one trial that went from eight bushels to 12 bushels. <laughs> you see a lot of uh, companies making claims around uh, you know, two or three trials only, but their whole marketing campaign is based on that. So it's, you know, it's unfortunate uh, because there are so many products and, and a lot of it's not backed by good agronomy or good, good science. So in response to that, in 2015, we launched the BioAdvantage trial program. So in addition to our small plot program, the BioAdvantage trial program is, again, farmer-led field-scale trials across Canada. So this year we have about close to 200 trials in the ground. Uh, so for example, we have our, our Quick Roots product on wheat, and we have that in about 40 locations. And that's in one year, and we'll do that next year and the year after. We start to build our number of replicates really, really high, so that you can gain confidence and people can and trust the BioEgg brand name. We're not creating claims off one or two trials, we're creating claims off hundreds of data points. And I think that there's, there's value in that. There's no other uh, testing program in the microbial realm like it. Uh, it really cements our leadership position with microbials. But I think ultimately, at the end of the day, it allow producers to look at our products and trust that they work, that we're not selling magic dust, that these bugs have a role, we understand them, and they're ultimately gonna help build yield. So do you see more products like this coming out down the pipeline in terms of microbial uh, enhancement type things? I think there's a lot of attention on microbials yeah. right now. All the big egg companies have a microbial division. Uh, it's an exciting time to be involved in biologicals. I think we're really just at the tip of the iceberg for understanding the soil micro plant interaction. And uh, I love being part of that. I think uh, being able to feed our crops and protect our crops using biological solutions is, is definitely a big, big part of the future in agriculture. All right. All right, thanks to Kelvin Hepner for that one. See, I told you it wasn't so bad. So that was an aim. Thank you for helping me out there, John. I couldn't, I was like, yeah. that's not a farm show. Like, what's going on? Um, but there we go. Okay, so a few things come out of that. Maybe, John, I'll go to you first just quickly. Are there any major updates to that? Are we still sort of in the buyer beware phase or have we, have we moved on to the, hey, we have some actual data? Well, a couple ways to answer that question. It it might even be worse now because there's there's so many new players, right? The rules the rules haven't changed, so the entrance there's really few barriers to entrance into the marketplace. So brew up some bacillus in your bathtub, make sure it's safe, and you can sell it, right? Um, now, obviously, I didn't come on here wanting to be a soapbox for our company. That's not what I'm trying to do here, but. You know, a, a sound testing program is really key. So it's interesting with that video clip. I don't know if I've ever even seen that one, 
but it was when we first started working with Quick Roots and we put it into our field scale testing program. And I can talk more about that later, but what happened, we saw phenotypic differences throughout that year. It was great. We were excited about it. When it came to filling the bin, guess what? We didn't see a yield increase. So we had roughly a hundred trials on soy, corn and wheat, and we were really scratching our heads. So the next year, but sorry, that year, one of our reps threw some, some penicillium bali in the mix with the, the trichoderma and the bacillus. And in those half a dozen trials, things came to light. Our yield was there. So the next year we went after that approach and we used the penicillium bali alongside the quick roots and it was night and day difference. And we did that on more crops and more crops year over year had now hundreds of trials under our belt before we registered the product. And that gave us insight into, you know, with the example of quick roots, where products maybe don't work or what the best fit is. Cause that's equally as important. We had full registration. We paid $41 million or whatever it was for the company. I'm sure the leaders would have loved us to just go out there and sell, but not a good experience for the end user then. So today that product is called Bionic and we've put it into tag team Bionic. It's a wettable powder. I mean, there's the modes of action are well understood, but the point is really getting out there in the field and proving it. And that, and I'll, I'll repeat some of the things I said in the video there, but to me that, that balance between the, the good science and the good agronomy is key. And we can talk about actually manufacturing as well, but you know, the science behind the products is pretty much indisputable. There's mountains of publications there, you know, like that's whether it be signal molecules, secondary metabolites, plant growth regulators, whatever those kind of the metabolites of the biologicals are well understood. Now getting them to work agronomically is another piece and doing that, I think in real life, field scale environments under real life growing conditions in your backyard, whether it be Ontario or Saskatchewan, right? And being honest and upfront with your data, right? And that's, I think, key to the biological piece. And, and I'll stop for here in a second, but the other is that we're not, we're going beyond yield as well. What, so what are these modes of action of these organisms? What are they doing? And how does that fit into an ag agronomic recommendation? It's not, well, I've got my complete input package done and I'm going to sprinkle some of the, I saw in the comments, some pixie dust, whatever you Pixed want to up. call it yep. at the end of a fertility package and say, oh, I didn't see anything where I did or whatever. Right. But it's more, <laughs> okay. Are we solubilizing phosphorus approximately how much, how does that fit into a fertility program? So mm -hmm. again, so well, John, I'll stop you there. Cause one of the things I do sort of want to talk about is sort of that distinction between what some of these products do, because they're definitely like, uh, you know, inoculants, we understand they work, we, we see what they do. They're a biological product, right? But quite well accepted. Um, so, so, you know, things like Jumpstart, some of these other ones that, that we sort of, but I want to talk about how they all fit in. But George, I want to go to you first, because um, you sort of laughed when he said it's almost worse. So, <laughs> What have you seen, of course, so with with your company as well, your company that's looking for some of these soil microbes as well, and then bringing them to a point where we can actually add them to our field as a product. What, you know, what are we up against out there as far as trying to sift through some of this um, fly poop out of pepper, as someone said? So, yeah. So how, yeah. Is it worse than however many years ago? Well, uh Interestingly, I was very much involved as I was a scientific expert for uh, for uh, film bios and SO biologicals on development of uh, the penicillin biology uh, mm -hmm. way back 25 years ago. And it is a terrific product as far as the microorganism goes. So so what what is what has occurred is that it's been quite easy to isolate microbes that are plant growth promoting. And, and it's it should be easy because nobody fertilizes 90% of the ecosystems on the world. They have their own fertilizer pro projects with their own microbiomes. I mean, if you look at uh, the prairies where we had 
enormous amounts of biomass produced before man came along, uh, those plants were growing just beautifully without our help. Uh, so getting those microbes back out is not a problem. What is a problem is how to grow them and deliver them and get them established. And that's been sort of the, the real plug in this thing, you know, but, but at the same time, this is primarily in Canada, we have not had a lot of support for development of these products. If you go to Brazil and you go to a show there, there's a hundred booths selling trichoderma of all the different species. And uh, I visited many countries where farmers have replaced their pesticides completely with biologicals. Uh, I went to a place in Costa Rica where uh, the guy was telling me he grows roses without any fungal issues, black spot and whatnot on roses, just with growing in his own little laboratory, uh, a, 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 a biological. So I think where you can apply it, and look, greenhouses in Ontario are almost completely biological. There's very little pesticides used in a commercial greenhouse in Ontario anymore. So we, we will be able to adopt, to adopt these things, but I think we need a lot more effort as far as research goes and we need more fermentation capacity on how to grow, grow these things and how to deliver them at a cost-effective manner. Mm -hmm. So uh, Lara brings up a really good point. Um, and shout out to Lara today. It was her last day with Real Agriculture, but she's sticking she's sticking around uh, and everyone will know where she's going soon. Uh, but typically Lara, who is my colleague, uh, would be the one writing this up as well at the same time. So Lara, it's lovely to see you, even though technically you don't have to be here right now. Um, so, so I do appreciate, but excellent question. How do we better set the expectation of which conditions a biological will work best under? Of course, she's going to read all the sciencey things because she loves to do that. But George, I'll start with you. This does seem to be one of the big hurdles and not just for adding a product, but even for fostering soil health um, in generally is trying to understand all the different systems that are at work in in this system. So so how how do we set the expectation of of how these will work or when they will work? Right. So <laughs> I would like to separate soil health from plant health. And the reason being is that when you look at the microbiomes of plants, they are very different. What is in the soil? You can they're completely different in many ways. Plants like humans select out their own microbiology and some of it comes from the soil, but a lot of it comes from the seed. About 50 percent comes from the seed itself. So uh, but so conditions make sure that the microbiomes that establish are the right microbiomes. And by that, I mean not the pathogens uh, or, or the, those that are maybe inhibitory to plants. Uh, so so it's, it's a matter of fertility, the right fertility and the right microbiomes. Uh, one of our foci has been to look at uh, what I call calling the sort of the early colonizers. Uh, we've shown that if you inoculate a plant at its very early, earliest stages with the microbiology, it will maintain it for at least six to eight weeks. Uh, and, and so we are very much focusing on uh, currently on uh, producing microbes that are going to be used for transplant crops. Uh, because if you are growing a plant in a greenhouse in a potting mix, it may be really easy to get that seed inoculated and those little plants inoculated with the right plants. And when you transplant them outside, they will take off like a rocket. I, George, Sorry. I, no, I just, you have, I never really thought about the seed and being inoculated with biome from the plant side. I've always sort of thought of it as it simply all comes from the soil. And so part of me, well, I just have an aha moment. Um, so that is that is fantastic. I've never, that like completely changes how I think about some of these things. So thank you for that. But and so John, I wanna build off that a little bit in that I think one of the things, let's back up a little. And uh, before we get overwhelmed by all the things that we could uh, use or do, um, you know, George has, has pointed out um, when we've talked about, um, you know, there's different actions that happen. So, so these products do different things. So maybe if you could, John, walk us through sort of the 
the sort of basics of, or if there are sort of general groupings that some of these biologicals fall into? I would say two, maybe three main buckets would be biofertility, biocontrol, and then depending on how you want to split up, you could get into what I like to call biomolecules. So not necessarily a living organism, but something that like a secondary metabolite that still has activity. So we can see that with like a lipokaito oligosaccharide molecule, LCO, which again, no shortage of scientific literature on the interaction between rhizobia and the plant. So it's a signal molecule. Okay. So those so, are the- Sorry, what, so what, that's an example of one would be, or what's an example of a, you said an LCO. I'm writing down all the acronyms because of course this is sure. agriculture. So we have to have many of them. So let's add. So them. LCO would be a signal molecule that okay. there's communication between a leguminous plant and the rhizobia that okay. associates yeah. with that plant. Another mm -hmm. signal molecule in that conversation would be a flavonoid. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. So Gord has a question. Just, Gord. Just, just oh, go ahead, Gord. Uh, yep. Uh, there's melatonin is a signal molecule. Salicylic acid is a signal molecule. Uh, mm. these, these are signal molecules for us too. Is this why we feel good when we work in the soil? Anyway, um, that's a completely, that's a whole other, actually, there's an area of science of like the things we get from yeah. sitting in the forest and also digging in soil. So there you go. That's a, that is not for this show though. That's a different yeah. show. Um, yeah. Somebody has a podcast somewhere, I'm sure. Okay, so Gord has a question. Now, Gord, um, he tells me his last name is pronounced exactly as it's spelled, which I can't do. So um, it seems like we need to better understand the context under which results are achieved. So fertility, microbiology, pesticides, et cetera, and might help explain why a product works on one site year and not another. So this is, I mean, for, for both of you, I mean, George, I know that perhaps you're more in the discovery phase and John, you're in the sort of proving phase, if I can generalize that, that big. Um, but, but that of course is the crux of what it comes down to, right? So, so from both of you, we hear loud and clear that we know that there are amazing things we can identify, we can isolate, but it's figuring out as, even as you related, John, what maybe combination of these biologicals in what delivery vehicle are really what delivers the value. So, so perhaps John, that is where maybe from a testing perspective, how does Novozymes BioAg sort of, how do you wade through that, trying to figure out what factors are, are, you know, contributing to the positive results? A, a good testing program, like for us, as I've mentioned a few times, that field scale real life testing environment and we're lucky because we do have a decent sized sales force dedicated to biologicals where we can establish hundreds of trials in a year including gathering all the information around fertility inputs previous crops right yield environments and we can take those data cuts and we can look what's happening we can see okay in a higher FOSS environment this particular bug or combination of organisms is going to be more successful, right? Or less, you know, that that's going to tell us how things actually work on the ground. And as George was saying, I mean, you can do a lot of work that's important in greenhouses and Petri dishes. I think sometimes we get heavily reliant on the small plot replicated trials, which, and if we're just testing biological treatment versus yield, we're not seeing the results in that univariate type study. Whereas if we incorporate, you know, other factors such as seeding dates versus treatment, giving us yield, a little bit more robust there. And I think sometimes the, just the testing environment, whereas if we're out like in these real life conditions, opposed to, you know, if we're working, like some of the bigger seed companies have their testing grounds that they're on year over year and they're, pushing their hybrids, they're pushing into the inputs and any of the results from the biologicals can be a little bit masked there. And we sometimes we don't see results in that testing environment. So I think an attention to soil health is really important when it comes to the functionality of the biologicals. But for us, what we've seen, and you know, we'll pat ourselves on the back a little bit, but the testing program, we call it the BioAdvantage trial program, 
really gives us some great insights into that, those real life conditions. And we, we know what's going on with our products a lot better than relying on, you know, four small plot replicated locations and trying to draw conclusions from that. And I, I you know, that's, mm -hmm. if people are doing that, I know companies that are out there, I see it all the time, you know, they're relying on a tiny bit of data, pushing the products out there. And that's where people are getting into the, you know, the poor experiences with the products. Now we're very mm -hmm. transparent with our data, our commercial partner, Nexus Bioag. You can go on the website, you can see all the data results year over year. You can isolate it to your, your province or probably even your, your location. We publish our wins, publish our losses and, and let people see what's going on with the products. And because we know the fits and we like, you know, that, that really helps us position our product successfully. Mm -hmm. Uh, John, I just wanted to mention there was a great comment about your wall earlier and everyone wants to know. So we're going to talk about your wall at the end of the show. Um, sure. We'll save the, you know, we'll save the chit chat for the end. This but, is, keep um, people engaged, I, right? Yeah, exactly. But I will tell you that we had a conversation about it before we started because I was also entranced by the wall. Mm -hmm. So now Lara and Pete are having a really interesting discussion. And George, I want to, before we go to some of the slides that you brought, because I, I want to go there next. Um, but this question of how does an added product, an added microbe, when we put it into something like field scale, like John's talking about, um, how do we how do we make sure it can do what it, it needs to do in that it could potentially be a very busy uh, network down below? How does an added microbe sort of outcompete or still shine in perhaps a very active ecosystem below ground? Is that a concern even? Oh, huge, huge concern. You know that uh, uh, the use of rhizobia is almost 200 years old and we still haven't optimized it. We, we, we only find that wild type of rhizobia are still commonly uh, colonizing plants and excluding the beneficial ones we put out. Now there's been many studies that show that the more bacteria, rhizobia, you put on a root, the better your colonization. And for a lot of the microbes we're developing and putting into agriculture, it's very hard to get those kind of numbers up into that range that we may need to get really good establishment. Uh, that's why we're kind of focusing currently on the transplant crops, because uh, we can inoculate a, you know, 124 tray of tomatoes with just a few mils of uh, inoculant. Uh, and, and the millions of billions of plants are transplanted. So, but getting it into the field where you are going to have to put it in with some kind of seed treatment and maybe covering the seed with it. We're going, uh, we developed, I'll show you at the end, uh, a, a little tank that actually drops a certain volume of liquid onto top of the seeds as it's being planted. Uh, but at, at some point, those are the things that we're going to have to focus on. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes, now, um, so someone did tell me that Gord's last name is Speck Snyder. And so I thank everyone, John, mostly for telling me um, in that he spelled it phonetically. And I appreciate that. Um, okay, so George, um, you did send some slides. And, and so I want to go through those now. Jay, if you could bring them up. Um, George, if you could walk us through what we've got here in, in sort of how we get from, you know, a discovery out and about into something that we can actually package and sell. Sure. Okay. Well, this concept of ecological agriculture really focuses on more reliance on the natural microbes that are there and, and methods that we can enhance their colonization. One of the one of the things that has occurred, and you can look this up, that uh, 47 percent of the nitrogen applied uh, is converted to biomass. And it used to be 68% in 1960. So in 50 or 60 years, we lost about 20% of the efficiency of nitrogen. This concept of nitrogen use efficiency is going to be very big in the coming years. And it's mostly because of loss of organic matter. Okay, next slide, please. All right. I just wanted to put this picture in. This is a bacteria that I isolated with Jersey Novak at the Nova Scotia Agriculture before he moved to the States. It's probably the best growth promoting organism on the planet. 
And what you see are sterile potato nodes that were inoculated with a single bacteria. And what you see is a controlled potato that grown from these nodes with one that's been inoculated with one bacteria, only one, under sterile conditions. And look at the difference in root structure. And in the, in the box, look at the, I don't know if you can see the slide, but in the boxes, you can see the differences in leaves and so on. These are pepper plants. Now, believe it or not, this particular induction is caused by gases as much as anything else. So what you see in this plate, in this slide, is uh, two, two sections of a Petri dish separated by a, a, a line, and only the gases can go across. And on one side, you have a, a plant that doesn't get the gas, and the other side, that you're seeing a plant that's stimulated. So what I wanted to point out this is these microbes have more impact on the physiology and growth pattern of plants than their own genomics. Okay. Yes. All right. So back about uh, a decade ago, I got lucky to meet a man named Dean Glennie. Uh, it was at a bar at the hockey arena in Montreal. And so it was easy meeting him. Uh, but Dean Glennie was the highest producer of corn on an average yearly production in Ontario. And he grew this crazy pattern of corn and soybeans on a no-till system. And he, be, he was doing this for 20 years. Uh, or, or more, and, and, and Dean said to me, hey, George, when I started, I was getting 150 bushels an acre. All my neighbors are getting that average. I'm getting 300. What did I do? So luckily, we went into Dean's farm. Next, please. And we tore it apart. We, we measured something like 400 factors in this field. In the center picture, what you see is our very sophisticated juice extractor that I ordered from Brazil, where they use it for sugarcane. And this was to extract the in, inside microbiome from inside the corn plant. And uh, we were able to then find out what is inside the stem. But we measured the root, the leaves, you name it. We took all the soil. We pulled out the whole plant with the root ball and everything and measured all the soil on the root, outside of the root, and so on. I, I won't get into all the factors. And we planted the same corn at a neighbor's farm the same seed, because the seed is important, as I told you, uh, where he was only getting 150 bushels. Okay, next. All right. What came out of this is a molecular technology that gives you a sort of like a chromatograph of a, of a microbiome. And with this microbiome, we were able to show that the microbiome of the leaf, the root, the surface of the root, and inside differed significantly in one plant. Each of those dots is one plant that we sampled from that field. And these uh, chromatographs look like if you were to take a wine from France and wine from California, you could overlay the compounds that are present in that wine. The only peak that should come up that's present in both is alcohol. Okay, the more the peaks overlap, the more the colony, the, the microbiome is similar. Okay, next, please. Okay, so as you can see, we, the roots, the soil on the roots kind of overlapped. The, the washed soil roots were kind of different, but the biggest difference was inside the plant. And these are what are called endophytes. And you can see on the top graph how far the microbiome was from the average site from the Dean Glenny site. And it was day and night differences in microbiomes. Next, please. All right. Well, we published this result and the, edit, the reviewer said, big deal. You measure two farms. What's the big deal? Who cares? Uh, so we said, they said, measure 100 farms. And we went out to measure 100 farms. And the first 10 farms that we measured, when we measured the microbiome, we found there was no differences in any of the plants. It's all the same. Well, we said, uh oh, something's gone wrong. Until one day we flew these uh, fields with a drone. And what we noticed was, that these fields are not uniform in their production. And what you see in the red are the stressed plants, and what you see in the green are the very healthy, vigorous plants. Your eyes will not differentiate this. Next, please. Okay, here's all the farms, some of the farms we flew, and what we did was we collected samples from the green zones and the red zones. And those, the green zones we considered healthy, the red zones we considered stressed. All right, you can see that every farm looks the same with the differentiation in red and green sites and so on. Next, please. Now, here's a kicker for you. 
This is small plot farms from the University of Guelph mm. production system. Look at that. Huh? So if you were to sample across a transect, you would get an average of the microbiome of that plot. But if you went to those little green zones and the red zones, you would say, holy macro, what's going on here? Why, why is the difference in the yield? So even small plots will not give you what you think you're getting. You'll get an average, not the differences between those stress sites and non-stress sites. Next, please. All right. So what we did was our primary measurement is yield. And what you see here is yield from 11 farms. Uh, the last two is two, two sites on one farm. And look at this. On many farms, we get up to 350 bushels of corn. But if you look at those poorly performing sites, as the last one, you'll see that we're averaging 287 on the healthy sites, the green sites, but we're only getting 125 at the poor sites. And I think every farmer in the world knows about this variability in their production system. Uh, but this, this was really a, 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 a learning lesson for us that what we're seeing with our eyes is not what cameras can see. Next, please. Okay, so here's a map of a farmer with a real-time uh, harvester that measures yields as he goes. And here's the uh, NDVI of that same field. And you can see how beautifully they overlap as far as yield goes. Now, their yield measurements are not as accurate as some of ours because we hadn't harvested the plots because, you know, they're going from 200 to 380 or something like that. But again, the yields are very much correlated, about 95% correlation between NDBIs and yields in cornfields. Next, please. Okay, so with all the chemical measurements, ENL is lucky to have uh, free measurements for chemistry of soils and tissues and all that for us. And what uh, Greg Patterson showed is that there was a correlation between what he calls his uh, 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 He's got an equation for relating a number of chemical components to yield. This is a, a, a function that he worked out. And you can see that there's a linear relationship over the three years. Some, yields, some years are better than others. Next. Uh, the microbiomes were split apart from the inside of the plant in many of these fields. Not all of them, but many. But they were very much related to yields. Next, please. Uh, we not only measured uh, the microbiome, but we measured function, nitrogen fixation, phosphate solubilization, release of sideropores. And we did this both with enzyme assays and we did it with genetic quantification of the genes present in those plants. Next, please. All right. Uh, you're going to have to uh, use a slide sorter for this. And so we had a statistician look at our data. And this is for 217 from expected and res results that we actually got. And if you look at the correlation, uh, it is absolutely phenomenal. Now, what this correlation is using is nine chemical factors and 12 biological factors. So we uh, kind of calculated how much benefit we're getting from the chemical components of the field and how much we're getting from the biological. And it was usually between 60 from the chemistry and 40% from biology. And that sort of stood up from other studies that are out there. Can you just flip on to the next one of this one? No, go back. It's a double slide. So it's, sorry, it's on top of each other. I don't know if you can go into uh, mode. Uh, 217 no, was I'm very not. Okay, it doesn't matter. 219 was really good. It was a you know, 0.9% correlation. 218 was horrible. Uh, and the reason we, one of those years, we had a huge drought and it changed everything. Uh, there was no rain yeah. for like four weeks or three weeks and the plants curled up like, you know, a tobacco a cigarette. Yeah. Anyway, so water is a very important component. Okay, next please. All right, so we collected about 4,000 microbes from these plants, particularly from the really healthy plants. So we sequenced them, we looked at their function. Next, please. And we have now tested putting together certain microbes to reproduce the healthy soil of Dean Glenny and the microbes and are finding really nice correlations. We published some of this as far as root production 
uh, plant production. Now, we haven't taken this to the field yet because the problem with one of the things is before you can go to the field and ask a grower to put these microbes into their field, you have to get permits and permits are a pain in the neck and you don't want to give it away. You don't want to put it out there without permits. So anyway, let's go to the next one. But we are working, as you see in the top left-hand corner, that's our little machine for putting different volumes of liquid on top of the seeds. We can put actually uh, nine different products in one small field plot. We are, uh, and you can see the tractor below it, planting it when injecting the liquid on top of the seed. We're working with companies to uh, mass manufacture these products uh, and uh, how to optimize them. They're also helping us optimize them. Now, it is kind of evident to us that in some cases, freeze-dried product does not work as well as the liquid product uh, as it's fermented because there's a lot of magical compounds in the fermented component. All right, next. next. Okay, so here's the new Holy Trinity, okay? This is the new, uh, so it's the plant, the soil chemistry, and the soil microbe working together and all directly related to the water content of the soil. Without water, none of these things work very well. Okay, and I think it's the next one, this last one maybe. Uh, so what we learned is, there's a high correlation between yield and area monitoring, of course. The majority of fields have high average and poor yields, about one-third, one-third, one-third. Uh, by focusing on the high versus low yield sites, we can identify dryers, drivers that maybe regulate high yielding sites. And the microbes play a major role in soil uh, and crop health. Uh, I think one of the things that we had hoped to do from this project that we didn't get funding for was to try to fix those sites that are underperforming. And if we think if we can push those poor sites to even average, then we can increase crop yield by 20, 30% across the country. Next, please. And sadly, uh, we were part of this uh, uh, smart agriculture submission to agriculture, to, to the government that they gave away a billion dollars. It wasn't successful. Uh, it was too bad because the next green revolution will com combine this biotechnology and smarter agricultural practices like drones and uh, monitoring from satellites and whatnot. And, uh, and maybe new equipment that doesn't disturb the soil as much as our old equipment used to. And this will hopefully lead to better crops and at lower costs. And that's the objective of this whole exercise. Next. And so, as you see, Buddha's head being brought up from the soil. This was taken in Thailand. The next green revolution will emerge from underground. So, George, I'm going to echo John's echo? comments that that is fascinating. Um, but also my camera is lagging, so oh I, I really apologize. But no. this is okay. So, so I see all that. And John, I want to get some of your thoughts on this. It, it is absolutely fascinating. I think many of us have seen NDVI maps and we sort of intuitively know, yeah, you know, high yield potential, low yield potential. But my question is, so in in any given field, we see that NDVI difference, which of course we can't see, but the drone footage can get it for us and we can get NDVIs. And you've identified the 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 strong yield potential, the lower or and what translated. And you within, you know, 90% can use microbe indicators to do that. How did those microbes get there and not in all over the field? Why did you find certain areas have them and certain areas don't? Right. And, and, and we haven't figured all that out, but we know some of the chemical factors that are highly correlated with those high yielding site. Potassium turns to be one of them. pH is very important. pH can uh, change the microbiology readily by, you know, if you have too much alkaline or too acid, some organisms just don't uh, take it. Uh, it could be mineral deficiencies, and it could be remnants of crops left from previous years, green manures or whatever, you know. We don't know why they're different. So, right. So, so some of those microbes potentially, I mean, so let's say there was, you know, those microbes, 
exist everywhere in that field or on that seed or whatever, but if they proliferate is dependent on the soil chemistry. That's where that triangle comes in. Yes, that absolutely. potentially pH can kill some off or can amazing. Okay, so John, you see something like that. What goes through your mind when you're when you're seeing those kinds of responses to some of these microbes? I think one of the things that we haven't really talked about is formulating and manufacturing, right? And mm. that's that's where the chasm has been probably since the 90s, where there was a lot of work done around microbes and whatnot. And then getting that to a commercial product or a usable product is difficult. And so that capacity to manufacture, to quality approve, have organisms stay alive both in the jug and on the seed becomes a big challenge and making it economical that somebody asked for, you know, what's the price per acre? And, you know, typically we're about five bucks an acre, just, just very roughly saying, I mean, <clears throat> have a great product and show response. And if it's 20 bucks an acre, then people are going to be pretty skeptical about that. So it's, you know, we can have great science, but if we don't have the manufacturing, we'll never get to the agronomic part of it. Yeah, my 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 target. So price, yeah, go ahead, is, George. Sorry, my target price is never going to be over ten dollars. It's going to have to be under ten dollars an acre. Yeah. Yeah. Or sorry, um, interesting. Yeah, uh, that's more like yours. <laughs> okay. So so John and and for George as well, where is most of the manufacturing happening right now for these products, for Canadian products? Let's say. Well, we're. <laughs> We manufacture in Saskatoon. BASF has a big manufacturing facility, literally two doors down from us. Uh, so here's big, I know, bit of, bit of work in Winnipeg. We bring products up from the States. We manufacture in Milwaukee as well. That's where the original nitrogen company sort of is still housed. Um, mm -hmm. And then we have facilities in Pilar and in, in Argentina. There's quite a bit in South America. I'm not as familiar with that, but. I know in Canada, Saskatoon's a bit of a center for manufacturing. Mm, okay, and George? Uh, in, in, you know, if you look at the internet of who has registered products, other than the two big companies you just mentioned, a lot of them are small little companies that, again, brew their products in bathtubs. <laughs> Not real bathtubs. Okay. But that's uh Close. yeah yeah well you know um <laughs> i it it wouldn't entirely surprise me and we've certainly <laughs> talked about um not just on the microbe level but on you know whether it's spray additives or whether it's whatever the case may be uh come up with a new formulation and uh and away we go so now we are we're running short of time i did want to send um of course a big shout out to our show sponsor adama canada uh for making this happen we've got some great comments we're going to roll through here in the end um all right so and and i have to say especially for this crowd that i i'm seeing at least in the comments um not shy as maybe the two of you have noticed um but it always seems there's a rush of questions in the last five minutes so i should probably remind people sooner um, that if we're going to talk about John's wall, we have to make sure we get our questions in um, earlier. Okay, so Lara wants to know the hardest microbe to culture and replicate during the manufacturing process. Or perhaps even put another way, what is it about a microbe that might make it difficult to do? So George, I'll maybe start with you. Um, is there one that's really tough or what makes it tough? Yeah, the gram-negative uh, bacteria are, are, have a very short shelf life. Uh, we're looking at we're trying to get them up to a one year, but we're still having trouble with even three months. The gram positives for, form spores that are indestructible, and you can keep them on a shelf for five years with no issues. Uh, so anything to do with gram negatives are very tough to keep. In a, you know, you can keep, if you were to use them within a week or two weeks, you'll get really good inoculation procedures, but uh, storing it is a no-go. John, is also, there any particular one? I was going to say, you know, if we're working with, say, two fungal species and we're putting them into one product and we want to quality control that, to enumerate two fungus becomes very difficult. So then you have to develop assays that knocks one out but not the other. So it's not always just about making the bugs. It's about being able to QC them 
and then as George was saying with shelf life and that like it's it's a lot that goes into it and we've we've tested commercial products in the states that bought them from the shelf took them to the lab there's nothing in there they're dead mm. now this is one of I your mean, your bathtub products but still, still yeah it's well and know, and realistically and and this is even i mean again two maybe perhaps the products we've had longest or are most most familiar with like our pulse inoculants or soybean inoculants mm -hmm. i mean you can get poor inoculation if the product isn't handled stored used properly right oh, i mean we are dealing absolutely. with living things so living things can die so let's you know make sure that we're keeping that top of mind absolutely so it does sound like a huge challenge okay so john has an interesting question so so seeing um you know what was going on in those fields in ontario how do we pivot quickly and study our own corn plants biome um and can we react in season to correct to correct efficiencies george do you see that as a potential next step or something you know the way agronomy works into this that we could get to a point where we could be testing this quickly and adjusting for it you know the the whole microbiome revolution by the way which is the largest project on the planet today the human microbiome but the plant microbiome is inconsequential the the whole thing has what has made it happen is cheap sequencing uh in 2000 when the Human Genome Project started, it was going to cost $600 million and about $10,000 to uh, sequence 1,000 base pairs. Now we're going to be able to do it for two cents. Uh, I can buy a sequencer on real time for a thousand bucks now. Uh, and and that uh, will allow us to go out there in the field with uh, handheld sequencers and say, all right, what's going on in this plant? And I'll also do a soil analysis and saying, okay, you've got to do a pH change in this zone or whatever. Uh, we may need to do it even before we get to that point. Okay. And so I think that works into Peter Johnson's comment. If good microbes are in the field, tillage should move them. Why do they not overtake the poor areas over time? Would that not be a natural progression? So that comes back to your point then, I mean, somewhat perhaps, but as you mentioned, it's, it's water driven, it's pH, it's whatever. So do, can we, I guess, further to Peter's point, can we encourage the good microbiome components to flourish in the field? Well, I can tell you this, that there, there's a, a meta-analysis meta, meta of all the studies that have ever been done with the incorporation of microbiomes from outside sources. And they found that 90% of the fields where you introduce microbes did have a long lasting or at least a measurable change in the microbiome that's in the field. And this is from thousands of studies that they took uh, the data from. Uh, so th there is potential for changing the microbiomes. Um, but I think one of the best ways to do it is with green manures and, and growing crops, cover crops are, are very good at changing the microbiome. It's, it becomes a systems okay. approach um, then. Yes. Very much. Right. That right. You're not, again, you know, I hear all the terms, the bugs in the jug. You're not going to add microbes and just magically see a change like that, right? To make a change from that poor yield environment, I mean, it's not just the microbe piece here. It's, it's how it's managed. It's the inputs. You know, we look at things like the regenerative agricultural systems and, you know, it's cliche, but feed your soil, feed your crop, right? Manage your soil. You're going to you're going to improve your tilth, you're going to improve your organic matter, you're going to improve your moisture retention, which is going to drive the microbial functions, right? And I think that's getting into that kind of paradigm is going to make mm -hmm. biologicals more successful. I agree. So Jason brings up a good point. So we've talked, we, we've talked about storage of, or finding them, um, manufacturing them, keeping them alive. Then there's also the question of delivery. So uh, Jason Vogt has a question here on pH of water. So should, do we need to worry about water quality uh, potentially with applying some of these products if, um, if they're in solution? Do we, is that potentially an area where we could be killing off some of these things? Well, for sure. You know, if you have a, a, a water that's very high pH or very acidic, you're definitely going to reduce your inoculum load. Plus, if you have a lot of chlorine in that water, for whatever reason, 
You know, best way to yeah. clean up water is chlorinated. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, Chlorine yeah. Water. Yeah. Um, okay. So now, and Gord would like to mention, there are so many questions coming to mind. We have a few minutes left, but he wants a part two of this episode. So... Oh. Uh, yeah so leave your leave your calendars open gents i'll be in touch in a couple months and we'll do maybe this fall we'll do a follow-up because um because well george and john both i think you know one of the things that that we've hit on here just in this last few minutes exactly is that um you know identifying the areas of our soil or our, our fields that require some assistance but that we can't solve it in one with one product or with one idea or with one, this is a much larger topic than just a bug in a jug, right? You know, uh, one of the one of the most amazing things I hear when we get some of our products to a grower and he tries it and it works for him. And he says, oh my God, I thought this was just fantasy. You know, they, they're just so amazed that when they get this microbial response in the field that they can see the difference. Be I wish I could show you one slide that would blow you away that was in the second presentation just one slide do you have it jay john is showing off his wall because there's still people need to know about the wall so thank you john i do appreciate the visuals we're going to get to that in a second yeah producer jay are you there or uh... i do not have it no okay We'll have to do it. We'll do it on the next one. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll, but, we'll have to go to it on the, it's, it's, on the It's a uh, slide of a, of a product we have registered that we sent to a grower in California who was growing lettuce. And he put it on half his field and not the other half. And you can see that the lettuce plants are about three times bigger on one side of the field and than on the other. And he, he just couldn't believe it. That's wonderful. You know, just um, a, there is, William there is, is asking is if... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll get to William in a second. I was going to say, there is so much to talk about. I mean, we could easily keep going here. But, you know, when regulations come into place, and, you know, I think we can say they're coming around fertilizer reductions in the 30% realm with our lovely government wanting 2025, 20, I think. We see the European Union looking at 20% fertilizer reductions, 50% less runoff. So, we may be forced to change our agronomic habits, in, right? And so then I think we're gonna be looking for solutions and that's where biologicals can provide solutions. And that's where we need to go beyond yield with our types of studies so that if we're looking at a phosphorus fertility equation, we can incorporate a biological that might give you 10 or 20 pounds an acre of phosphorus available, right? And so if you're, you know, if you need 40 or 50, but you're, even legally only allowed to apply 30, here's some tools that can help you gain, gain the efficiencies with the use of the microbes. So that, you know, it's not, that day I think is coming. I think, I think you're probably right, John. I think uh, nitrogen, I mean, already is, is certainly under the microscope uh, regulation wise and more. Um, and I think just more of it is coming. Uh, absolutely, for sure. John, quickly, Sean would pay for Starlink in a heartbeat for me. It's that it's not available yet, but I am on the waiting list. Um, so maybe if you have like an in at Starlink, you could let them know that I need it sooner. Um, William says, is any of this available outside this presentation? I came in way too late. It's mind blowing. Thank you, William. That is fantastic. We think that too. Um, this is, so it will be on YouTube immediately after one, we're done this live broadcast. You can go right back to the beginning and watch it from the beginning. It, of course, is also available on real agri realagriculture.com slash agronomists. Uh, this episode and all the ones we've done before, we keep the entire uh, library on that site. So you can, of course, find it there. Um, so by all means, find us on the Real Agriculture uh, YouTube page um, or at realagriculture.com. Um, and yes. All right, John, the time has come. Tell us about your wall. It's beautiful. All right. Well, let's I love see it. Here. Did you do? Cool. Did you do it yourself? Because that's what John Bosch wants to know. No, it's I didn't gorgeous. do it myself. I had somebody do it, but it's part of our larger basement development. Yeah, look at, look that. at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful. Now, do you dust it, or does someone else? Because I feel like there's a lot of ledges that would collect dust. I don't know if it's <laughs> ever been dusted. Uh, oh, there you go. It's like my is house. It, yeah. Is it somewhere in the marriage contract? Who does? Yeah, exactly. Who does the dusting? 
Yeah, if she wanted the wall, you have to dust it? I don't know. Something yeah, like that's that. probably how it's going to work. It's fairly new. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, so there you go. Anyway, it is beautiful. I love it. Um, if someone would like to do that on one of my walls, have at her. Um, my content okay. sucks, All right, this the has wall been... is pretty good. Yeah, exactly. That's the comments we're going to get. That and Lindsay's internet is terrible. Okay. So, um, so yes. All right. Uh, Lara suggests a pressurized uh, air in a can. That's not a bad idea, Lara. Just shh, away you go. Um, okay. All right. George, John, this has been fantastic. Thank you for sharing your time, your knowledge, your expertise, uh, being willing to, to be on this program um, and face the masses. Of course, we've got a lot of and brilliant people who hop on and ask some great questions and I appreciate each and every one of them. So George, thank you. John, thank you as well. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. All right. This, this was the agronomist brought to you by Adam at Canada, Real Ag Radio and Mind Your Farm Business. Um, as always, head to realagriculture.com slash agronomist for your CEU credits. I am Lindsay Smith. I have been your host. I'll be back next week talking compaction. So I've got Jody DeJong Hughes and Ian McDonald out of Ontario. We're going to talk about uh, the mess you make in the fall and what you should or should not do about it in the spring. Uh, thank you to everyone uh, who joined us tonight. We'll see you next week. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>